So in the interest of time, because I know there's a lot to cover and we're anxious to hear from our colleagues, very, very grateful for both Lion and Anita with the Coalition for College Cost Savings for joining us today. We will begin and I will turn the call over to them um, and we will just, oh, I think Patty has just joined and so we're just waiting for one other person. But without further ado, thank you so much for being with us today, all of my LICU colleagues and President McNeely um, and Anita and Lion, I will turn it over to you now. That's great. Uh, thank you, Kenya. And in, in uh, Zoom fashion, of course, I'm going to share my screen. So let me see if I can, I can uh, get to there. Hello, Dr. Holland. Thank you for joining us. All right. Uh, now I will just ask for someone to let me know that they can see my screen, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. We can okay. see it. Awesome. All right. Well, I, I thought the, the best thing to do, Kenya, was to start out just with a, a real quick and brief overview of the coalition. Uh, I'm, I know there are some on the, on the line that uh, know everything about the coalition, but there are some that, that may be brand new to it. So I will briefly um, pass through a few slides just to, just to give a summary of who the coalition is and where we came from. Uh, Back in 2004, uh, several business officers or, or, or member services people from different, uh, different states got together and started talking about what they were doing within their state to enhance dues, enhance the value of dues and work with vendors to create discounts, rebates, et cetera. And they found that they, in each state they were doing very, very well uh, they decided that if they could combine and use the collaboration and the leverage of several states, then they might be able to do even, even better for their colleges and universities. Uh, so they started talking about what they could do. They looked for a GPO, group purchasing organization, on a nationwide basis. Really couldn't find one. There was not one that was devoted to private higher education and the nonprofit area. So they proposed a business plan in 2005, and in 2006, they actually incorporated under a 501c3 status and named the entity the Coalition for College Cost Savings, which is a very long phrase, which we have shortened to just the coalition. So you'll hear me refer to it as the coalition. Uh, our mission is to support higher education member organizations, i.e. the LAICUs of the world. Uh, we have 30, 34 across the nation. Um, we're in 35 states now, so, uh, uh, but our mission is to support those organizations by creating programs to reduce costs, increase efficiencies, transform processes, and hopefully you'll see some of those today. Quickly looking at our footprint, the dark blue states are states where we have members. You can see Louisiana is prominent down in the south, uh, but we extend all the way out to the west coast, along the coast, the gray, states that you see there in the west, uh, we really don't have much opportunity there because they, they don't even have member associations like LAICU. Uh, there are just not enough private colleges in those states to support an organization. So uh, we really, by adding California this year, have covered the continental United States. Uh, we represent over a thousand different colleges and universities and well over three million students in those colleges and universities. So what that does for us is give us leverage when we go to vendors, when we talk to vendors about how to access the private nonprofit higher education market. So that is a really quick brief overview of the coalition. Uh, as I talk today, please make this interactive. Please stop me, unmute your, your, your line there, unmute your computer, ask questions. Uh, that's, that's the way we will be most effective here. So let's move on and let's look at the actual programs the coalition has. Now these are all the, all the current programs of the coalition. We're not going to talk about all of those today because I'd keep you here until, until the evening hours. We're just going to talk about a few that uh, we had suggested to Kenya might be the most important to, your, to you all as members. And you see those on the screen. And in fact, we'll look at them in this order. We'll look at Paymerang first, then IMA, ENI, switch to United Healthcare Student Resources, Fastenal, uh, Pan American Life, and Healthiest You. 
And to do that, I'm going to switch out of the um, out of the PowerPoint and switch over to another slide. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a second, and then I will start sharing again after I pull up my slides. Let's see. Okay, we should be back on my screen. And if I can get my mouse to work. Come on. There we go. I assume everyone can see the Paymerang uh, flyer that's up. Uh, Paymerang is the, is the first program I'd like to talk to or talk about today. Paymerang is our fastest uh, growing program. It's our most popular program. Uh, to me as a former CFO, it, it, it's, pr it's a pretty much no brainer program. Uh, Paymerang does for vendor payables what ADP does for payroll. So if you keep that in mind, uh, Paymerang will pay your vendor payables. They'll pay your vendor payables uh, through a ghost card if possible, but they will, they will pay based on what the vendor wants. If the vendor wants a check, they'll pay by check. They, try to, they encourage the vendors to go to ACH or ghost card as much as possible because obviously they make money on the ghost card and then they remit some of that money back to you all uh, on the ghost card. So, so it's just... Uh, like I said, it's our fastest growing program. I actually believe, don't we have somebody on the line that is using uh, Tamarang? Centen is Centenary on the line today? <clears throat> we are. Yeah, let me, let me just, uh, and, and we haven't talked, so uh, I, I always do this because, because I think it's always a great, great to have CFOs or, or controllers or, or the like uh, speak about a program. Uh, so I'm just going to turn it over to you and, and let you explain Paymerang and, and your interaction with them, whether it's been good, bad, or in between. Well, I'll start by saying um, I think it's been excellent for us. Um, <clears throat> really enjoy uh, our Paymer Paymerang and the services that they provide. I I'd start by just saying maybe that uh, when I came to the college, uh, we were still uh, using, um, and I got here six years ago, uh, manual checks for just about everything. And so every Tuesday and Thursday, I would have a stack of checks <laughs> uh, on my desk uh, uh, to sign and was looking for a, a good solution that uh, where our, uh, our accounts payable person, we're a small house, so we only have one accounts payable person, uh, wouldn't have to, you know, if we were using direct deposit, uh, she would have to each semester input all the direct deposit information of students, you know, so really making her job a lot, a lot harder. And so we ran across uh, this company, Pay Meringue, that kind of like uh, uh, you mentioned, sir, uh, they will step in <clears throat> uh, to do payments for you by passing out uh, to your vendors uh, in and they, they recently are doing students now as well, which when we first got with them, they were not doing students, but they will uh, get with your vendors and uh, send them like a credit card, uh, which I'll call credit card, you mentioned ghost card, uh, uh, to make their payments. Um, now I will tell you, a lot of vendors did not like that, but nonetheless, they did accept it. Uh, <clears throat> and it has been, with the exception of initial pushbacks, uh, it's been pretty much a seamless effort. So what used to be uh, a stack of checks like this, I, I now may sign about uh, 10 to 15 checks, you know, from vendors that, that uh, won't uh, accept anything other than, than a, a check from us, say like our utility company or, and <laughs> stuff like that. The other good thing about it is it's also a, a small revenue generator from, uh, uh, for us. So the more vendors that, uh, that we put on the program, uh, which no vendor's gonna say no, um, 
you, know, you get a revenue uh, kickback. And, <clears throat> and I didn't know we were going to talk about this, so I don't have those numbers. But I would say, you know, we probably earned maybe about uh, five to six thousand dollars a year, which been good. You know, that's a that's a ten thousand dollar swing. You think about from not earning anything to to now earning uh, the uh, five thousand dollars. So uh, it's been a good company for us. The last thing I will add is uh, during the pandemic uh, when we had our cares, uh, when we see our cares fund, we had to push those dollars out. Uh, to, to students, again, we're, we were addressing all of our students. So the idea of writing a check, signing a check for all those students was just, <laughs> was not something I was looking to do. Peyton Moraine stepped in uh, and did the uh, e-checks uh, for each of those students. So it, again, it took work, a massive workload off of my uh, accounts payable person, took a massive workload off of me, and it was an uh, 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 seamless to, to students. Other than we did have to give some students some tutoring on it, but beyond that, uh, was pretty smooth. So that's that's what I would say. Great. I, I really appreciate it, Bob. Uh, I I do this whenever there's some there's a Paymarine customer on the line or or in a group. Uh, I I never preempt it so so that they can speak honestly about uh, about Paymarine. I have never had a negative comment. Uh, Paymarine has lost one customer since they've been part of the coalition. And that customer they lost because of a political relationship with the local bank. And we all know how that goes with your development departments, your advancement departments. Uh, so one customer in all this time and, they, and they, they're growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, I, I will add as a former CFO, the thing that I like the most about Paymarine is it insulates you uh, between you and your vendors. It insulates you and your bank accounts from your vendor's accounts receivable people. They no longer will know your bank account information. They won't know your account numbers. They won't know your route, the routing numbers. They won't have any way of knowing how to get into your bank account. I think in this day and time, that's a huge plus. Uh, the other thing that Paymarang does is it maintains compliance. It maintains compliance with NACHA, uh, all the other, the, all the other, um, what the red flag rules, all the other rules that you have to keep up with and all the things that you're supposed to be doing that unfortunately I will say when I was a CFO, we weren't the best at doing that because it was just so onerous to keep up with all of it. Uh, they keep up with it, they do it for you, they make sure you're in compliance and they pay you to do all this. Lastly, Bob made a, made a great point. Uh, when you're reconciling at the end of the month, think how easy it is if you use an outside vendor for your, uh, for your payroll to reconcile your payroll account. Your accounts payable account, now your vendor account can become just that easy to reconcile. It, uh, it saves you a lot of time. Uh, I won't belabor Paymarang. I, I think it's, it's just a great service. Uh, it's definitely better than the banks. Uh, I could go on about that. But uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. Uh, Paymarang. Can I just add a, a, a sure. small notion to that? is that uh, what I thought about my people really enjoyed was uh, also was, uh, you know, uh, when you're sending out checks, there's always people who never cash those checks and you have to kind of track those things out. That, that all goes away. That, that all goes away with pay uh, you're, you're no longer hunting uh, uh, checks that have not uh, been cashed or getting emails or letters from your state saying, hey, here's some unclaimed property. Is this yours? <laughs> Right. Paymarang follows up on, on any checks not cashed, I believe, within 60 days and, uh, and either cancels them or, or takes care of the sheet problems. They, they take care of running those down. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, if there are not any other questions about Paymarang, we'll move on to the next program. Lion, you did have a question in the chat. How, oh, does, Paymarang, how does Paymarang make their money? Paymarang makes their money by... Uh, charging, well, they receive, as, as you know, if you pay by ghost card or if, or if your vendors pay by card, uh, there's a rebate from the card company, from MasterCard Visa. There's a rebate. Paymarang keeps a portion of that rebate, and then they send the portion of that rebate on to you. So that's how Paymarang makes their money. Thank you. It Really, it, it's the only service that, that I've ever seen that actually will pay you to do things for you. Uh, it, it sounds too good to be true, but, uh, but I really encourage everybody to take a look at it. 
Bob, Bob is right. It's, it's, it's a pretty great service. Uh, it's the only one that will pay that I have that will pay you to do stuff for you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move on to our program called IMA. It should load on my screen here. IMA is our property and casualty liability insurance program. Uh, at the coalition, we try to look at the largest line items on your expense, in your expenses and go after those to try to drive the cost down on those. Uh, we looked for about two years for a property casualty insurance program. Uh, thought we had found a few, but the problem was uh, the programs always wanted, the, the brokers or the carriers always wanted us to get a committed group of schools that said, yes, we will, we will sign on the dotted line and we will do this before they would put deep discounts together to give us a program. Well, as you all know, you don't wanna sign on the bottom line until you know what your price is going to be. So we couldn't get a group together to do that. That happened in many states, many state organizations found that to be a problem. We finally found in the broker IMA and their access to a, a very large nonprofit group of insurance uh, clients, uh, a program where it was already established. These are the majority of the program consist of healthcare entities. If you think about healthcare entities, they have bricks and mortar. Uh, they are very similar to colleges. Uh, a lot of expense in bricks and mortar and equipment, just like colleges, a lot of expense in bricks and mortar. Uh, they are subject to the same perils as we are, slips and falls. We're not talking about medical malpractice. We're just talking about the property and casualty. Uh, slips and falls, roof damage, wind damage, uh, in the Midwest tornadoes, more down south and on the East Coast uh, hurricanes. So very homogeneous perils. We were able to tap into that already existing nonprofit uh, market uh, to achieve discounts in our property and casualty insurance. You can see by the, by the brochure here that uh, the average discount that, whoops, the average discount that we're seeing is about 34%. Uh, tremendous savings because you're not just, you're now not just being evaluated as, uh, forgive me Stanton, but Holy Cross, you're being evaluated as just a member of this very large group of nonprofits, which spreads the risk immensely and, uh, and allows you to achieve great discounts. Uh, we found a great broker in IMA. If you're not familiar with IMA, they're a national broker. They are very experienced in higher ed. And uh, I really encourage you to uh, get in touch with uh, Blake. Blake Wells is the, uh, is the broker there that is responsible for our program. Blake is of immense uh, experience and technical expertise. Uh, they the other thing that we asked them to do was be very considerate of the time of the CFOs. When I was a CFO, the last thing I wanted to do was fill out enormous paperwork just to get a quote on property and equipment. Uh, they have a very short one page evaluation that you can fill out, send in, they will then come back and say, yes, we can do something for you or no, we can't. They'll be very honest. At that point, if you wanna, con if you wanna continue and get, uh, get the details and a, and a firm quote, they'll continue. But uh, the best thing about them is, is they're very cognizant of CFO's time. I've made that very, very, uh, I've made that point to them more than once, put it that way. I know you guys are busy. I know it's really easy just to renew with the current carrier, but uh, these guys can save you a lot of money. Please consider it. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> how, how do you compare this program with like EIIA, which Good question. This program, this EIIA, as I understand it, is pretty rigid. Uh, it, the, the limits and the deductibles and, the, and what's covered and what's not covered is, is very rigid. Uh, when we went out to market and looked and then got this program and developed it over about a six to 
to 12 month period actually with IMA, we made sure that limits can be, can be variable, uh, deductibles can be variable, uh, what they cover and what they don't can be variable. Uh, I remember there was some consternation in the, in the EIIA program about uh, you have to have aircraft coverage even if you don't have a small plane or you have to have some other, there was another coverage that, uh, that was required coverage even if you didn't need that peril covered. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say. I would say that the difference really is that you're in a bigger group. You're in a huge billion, billions of dollars. It's the largest nonprofit uh, insurable value group in the nation. Uh, so you're in the largest group possible uh, and you have flexibility. Any other questions? That, that was a great question. We looked at EIIA, we looked at a few others. Uh, like I said, we, we looked at Marsh, we looked at all the big guys. All of them wanted us to put together a group that would be committed. They wanted a group of 10 to 20 schools at minimum that we be committed to signing on the program and signing up the first year. And we just, our, our members schools just, just wouldn't do that. So, so we couldn't go there. If there are no other questions, we'll move on to the next one. The next one is our United Healthcare Student Insurance Program. Uh, this is uh, also probably this is our number two most popular program. Uh, covers and it's and it's a very basic program. It covers your student health. Uh, it has TeleDoc. If you're familiar with TeleDoc as uh, telemedicine, it has that embedded in it. So you don't have to pay any more for telemedicine, for telebehavioral health or telemedicine if your students have this program. It is a mandatory waiver program. So, uh, so that you have to understand that. Uh, but we have, we have, I don't know, Anita, we have over a hundred schools that are involved in this program. It's uh, tremendously popular. And the, uh, the renewal rate on these schools is incredible. And that always tells me that, that they're doing something right. We have a great partner in First Risk Advisors. They're the broker that exclusively has the rights to, uh, to this program through United Healthcare, And they do a phenomenal job. Uh, they will come on campus and do all your, well, they would come on campus if there wasn't a virus going around, but they'll come on campus and do your enrollment with your students. Uh, uh, they'll do it remotely if that's how you want to do it. They'll take as much off of your plate as possible to get this uh, program up and running for you. All right. So uh, there are no questions about that. We'll move on to our affiliation agreement with E and I. Uh, I assume everyone is familiar with E and I, a, a large group purchasing organization in the educational, uh, strictly devoted to education, uh, higher education, and K through 12. Uh, I've just put up a slide to show the different contract categories. They have contracts. Uh, just about for anything that you could you could buy. Uh, that's why we have we have a few targeted contracts that are coalition only. Uh, we try to fill in the gaps where we think the smaller private nonprofit higher education entities uh, need them. They have they have great contracts though. Uh, the only problem I would say with E and I is, and I'll speak for for my my campuses when I was a CFO. E and I can be hard to access and they're working on that. In fact, I've got, a, I've got a call with their new CEO this afternoon to talk about that. But I did not have a devoted procurement manager on my campus that did all the purchasing. My, my purchasing was decentralized. I had unsophisticated buyers all across campus and it was hard for them to navigate the contracts with E&I. So, if you're, if you're finding that there's a problem, if you're having any sort of problem in, in that area, if, uh, if you need help, just give us a call, give Anita a call or myself a call. I'm sure Kenya could, could also help you. E&I is glad to help you. 
uh, but they are they are a little daunting when you when you open up their website and look at their contract portfolio. Uh, just if if you want to buy a microscope, you need to know what vendor you need to buy that microscope from. It's hard if if you're not a procurement professional to to know which contract you might want to use. So uh, we're here to help. Please let us know. Uh, some of them are are easy to understand the office equipment, the office supplies, some of those, the computer uh, networking, the computer hardware and soft, well, the hardware uh, through CDWG is pretty easy to access. Uh, but if you're having any problems, please let us know. Uh, I, I would say that uh, um, at least my situation at Centenary College or, or our uh, situation, similar to what you described, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I am de facto the, the con contract manager yep. from the college and, and all my, and everyone who's walking around here is some sort of procurement <laughs> officer, uh, either by uh, use of the uh, business purchase card or just the necessity of going through a purchase order and doing all that legwork. And, and so uh, when you talk about E&I, the initial when you popped up, I said, man, that is great. That that would be awesome. But <clears throat> if they're hard to navigate, I just, man, that's just not a fight I want to have with the faculty. <laughs> right. Because honestly, they're, they're not paid for, for that. They recognize that they're providing the, the college with a, uh, a good service. And to be honest with you, they do a hell of a job. You know, they, they yeah. follow their way to find pretty good discounts. So uh, and I think this would be, uh, <clears throat> you know, until they smoothed it out, I, I think it would not be well received. Right. The, the, new, the new CEO put out, uh, a, not a white paper, but actually a video and, and a letter to, to all of us that are members uh, of, of their GPO uh, saying that he's trying to do what what uh, we've envisioned for a long time. He's, he's putting together a marketplace. Uh, it's sim will be similar to Amazon so that you can go on the marketplace, you can put your product in and the contracted price and the, and the products would come up in that marketplace. So that will make it immensely easier to navigate their, their contracts. I really hope they get that, that done. Uh, you, but Bob, you're, you're exactly right. What I did at my, at my schools was say, I set a limit and said anything over a certain amount, let's look for a contract. Let's, let's find it out there. E and I has great contracts for that. Uh, my, my favorite story is going into the VPAA's office and sitting there and I was talking with them while I was there. The biology professor comes in and says, you know, all those microscopes that you promised me, did they get approved in the budget? VPAA said, yes. He said, can you get them ordered for me? VPAA said, yes. And within a minute or two, the biology professor was gone. The, the VPAA yelled to this administrative assistant and said, will you get those microscopes ordered? And, you know, it was, it was a significant purchase for us. We were purchasing over 100 microscopes. Uh, so I just casually, after I left, walked out and, and asked the uh, administrative assistant how they were going to go about purchasing those. And the, she said, well, I'm just going to Google the specs and see what price I can find. So those are the type of purchases that it might behoove you to use E&I for uh, if, you can, if you can help them use it. Uh, yeah, but Bob's definitely right. It's, with decentralized purchasing, it's, it's very, very hard, very hard. Anybody else? All right, then we'll move on to our next program, which is Fastenal. If, I don't know how many are familiar with Fastenal or might use Fastenal, but uh, most everybody is probably familiar with Granger. Granger supplies your physical plant with, with all the things that they could possibly need or want. Uh, Granger is a great company. Granger has a great contract, by the way, with E and I. So if you're just buying directly, if you buy through the E and I contract, you'll save a lot of money. Uh, Granger is really good if you have a sophisticated fiscal plant person that knows exactly what they need, and they can just order it online, use a P card, get it in, and, and be done with it. Granger is the way to go by far. If you need more handholding, if you need more of that uh, interaction 
then Fastenal might be better for you. Fastenal will actually come to campus. They will talk to your physical plant director. They will, they will give their insight into, into what parts can be generic parts, what parts can be you really shouldn't go generic on, filters, belts, you name it. Uh, Fastenal will put their own inventory in your physical plant for commonly used items. They'll put it in there on consignment. Then they'll come in every so often, count, replenish. So things, I know here in Kentucky, uh, I, at, at my campus, we had, we had an equestrian division. We had lots and lots of uh, lines of fence, uh, miles of fence, actually. We had to weed eat that fence constantly. So weed eating line, it was, was in our consignment base. Uh, we had other things, work gloves, uh, eye protection, ear protection, all sorts of stuff that you don't think about uh, was in that, that consignment. Now, if you're a bigger college, they'll actually put a, a vendor kiosk in there that dispenses it like a, like a vending machine. So they'll do that for you. They're, as you can tell, they're very much more hands-on, hand-holding, how do we help you uh, outfit than Granger. So you just... It, it depends on where your fiscal plan is and, and the experience you have there and what they're, what they're comfortable with, which way you need to go, either Fastenal or Granger. Uh, next, we have if it'll come up. There we go. Hope you can see it. Uh, this is our newest program. This is uh, I mentioned that the United Healthcare Student Insurance had TeleDoc embedded in it. So if you have the student insurance for your students, they automatically get TeleDoc, the telemedicine and the telebehavioral health, just through their insurance. If your campus does not have our United Healthcare program uh, for your students, then you have access to Teladoc, actually it's Healthiest You, which is their subsidiary. I apologize, I needed to turn that phone off. Uh, Healthiest You is a subsidiary of, health, of Teladoc. That's the subsidiary that uh, supplies service to higher education. So Healthiest You will provide service to your, to your students. This is a waiver program. Uh, for your students, but, it but you can also cover your faculty and staff. You can cover your employees with it. Uh, I am going to forget the dollar amount. Anita, can you help me with the uh, per month, per participant dollar amount? Sure. I think it's there on page two. If you scroll up a little bit, you'll be able to read the amounts there. Up, oh, down. down the line. <laughs> a little bit more. That's it right there. Okay, I'm still missing it. Sorry. So it's it's well, it's three fifty. If you do not oh, if you do not offer the United States uh, the United Healthcare Student Resources, it's three fifty per participant per month. Three fifty per participant per month. Uh, we negotiated hard and, and got it down to that. Uh, I don't know if you'll find a, a lower rate. If you do, please let me know because uh, we couldn't. Uh, now that includes telemedicine and telebehavioral health. Uh, it also includes, uh, if your students have any dependents, it would include dependents of your students, but it also includes the dependents of your faculty and staff if you extend it to your faculty and staff. So the 350 per month is if you do not participate in the student health insurance. We also have an option if you do participate in the student health insurance for those students that waiver out because their parents have insurance. If they want to be part if you want them to have access to telemedicine and telebehavioral health, then it's two dollars per month for those students that wave out of the out, wave out of the uh, student health program. So we're really excited about this one. It's with arguably the largest telehealth, telemedicine, telebehavioral health program in the nation. Uh, Teladoc keeps buying their smaller uh, competition. The if, if you haven't noticed the whole telemedicine over, over this COVID issue, the telemedicine uh, industry has been consolidating very quickly. 
because they've been doing very well, obviously, during this time. Uh, Teladoc is the big gorilla in the room. We were very happy to be able to go straight to them and, and get a deal with them. So uh, if, uh, if you're thinking about this for your students, if you're having trouble, and, and the, really the genesis of this was about two years ago, I had a lot of CFOs that were really searching for a telebehavioral health answer because in the more rural settings, they were telling me it was very hard to get clinical personnel in uh, eight hours a day in a clinic, much less uh, 24 seven. So this, this was the way that they wanted to augment their, if, their clinical staff that they had on campus. And uh, we think we found a, a really great partner in Teladoc, Healthiest You. And again, the broker that is, that is distributing this for us is our friends, First Risk Advisors, the one that has been distributing the student health insurance through United Healthcare. So they're, they're very knowledgeable about colleges, universities, how you all work, uh, especially the private side, because we work a little different than the publics. Uh, they know a lot of our, our customer base. They'll be more than happy to, uh, to walk you through this if you would be interested. So I have a, I have a question. It's Tina yes, Holland. I'm president of um, Franciscan University in Baton Rouge. Yes, ma'am. And um, you did say that, you know, they, they are sensitive to the particular needs of privates. And my question would be that given the, the nature of this particular service, um, whether or not you've gotten much feedback from uh, faith-based institutions in particular and um, the approach that these folks would take and how their approach is aligned with um, faith-based institutions, particularly um, you know, Christian or Catholic faith-based institutions? Excellent question. Uh, and, and this is the first question I've got along these lines, so thank you for asking it. Uh, I'm going to say Remember that this is not insurance. This is the actual providers. So, right. And that's what that's what I'm concerned. Like, because in mental health, there's so many, there are a lot of different approaches. And um, the, the, the seamlessness between spiritual health and mental health um, in some institutions is, is really, you know, there's a, there's a real tight connection. And in some institutions, not so much. So I, I was curious to see, you know, if you've gotten feedback from particularly faith-based schools? We just launched this in the last couple of weeks. Let me, uh, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather not mm -hmm. give you the wrong answer. Let me, okay. let me ask and see what they do, if they do anything to differentiate, and, uh, and I'll let you know. Thank you. That, that's a great question. Uh, one, just, I understand it completely. I, I worked for a, a, a Catholic-based uh, university, so. I, I really, I understand. Ryan, can you speak to the issues of liability and how that's handled in terms of this? Question. Yes, all the practitioners in, uh, in Healthy Issue carry their own private, um, obviously medical malpractice insurance. Uh, this would be, this is no more than just providing, if, if you do this, this is no more than providing insurance to the, to the students or, or providing, if I'm sure in your athletic program, you probably have a, a preferred provider like a hospital or an outpatient clinic or something for your athletic training. Uh, it would be nothing more than that. So uh, I'll, I'll say there's very limited liability to the college or university, of course, in these days of deep pockets and proliferation of, of lawsuits. We all know that, that Anytime anything happens, we're going to be named, but the uh, but the probability is is I'll just say the probability is low that uh, that anyone will will get back to the university or college through this. But absolutely, the all the practitioners and that's one that's actually one good thing about uh, a service like this. This service keeps up and does the credentialing of all the the practitioners. Uh, and make, and they have in their database of practitioners, they know when their, when their malpractice comes up and they are on the list of the malpractice with the malpractice carriers. So if a practitioner's malpractice was to go lapse for some reason, then Teladoc will be the first to know about it. 
Um, the, the other question I would have is the relationship between this service and the student affairs professionals on campus um, and whether or not this is um, something that is completely just sort of at arm's length and this is um, completely protected by HIPAA as if the, the, the student were going to their own family physician or are they treated as a service of the university such that when say there's a behavioral concern that there might be a need to know and therefore disclosure of information to a student affairs professional. I was kind of curious as to how that relationship would work. Uh, definitely governed by HIPAA, uh, as most everything is. Uh, the student would have to allow the practitioner through Healthiest U to notify on campus. Uh, and, and that's where you're, that that's where you 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 walk that balance of of liability and not you you to to maintain that uh, that wall of liability you may not want to know but then you may need to know for for other reasons so mm -hmm. the student would would absolutely have to allow that to happen right. unless you. unless now unless the student is referred by the the um, student affairs personnel to use this service. So uh, in that way that your student affairs people would know that they had referred it, they wouldn't know what happened, right? what what was going on. Uh, then they then the student affairs could obviously talk to the student and ask them if they would be willing to release or, or talk with uh, the professionals. Thank you. Lion, if there are no more questions about this, I actually did have a question about Fastenal as it pertained to sure. COVID environment and PPE and you know all of the additional needs that our, our institutions have around um, physical plant, cleaning, safety, um, sure. in terms of what the savings that institutions that would participate, have they realized? And just if you can talk about that space a little bit. Sure, we've seen a, we've seen a huge increase in uh, the volume of spend from all our colleges that use Fastenal just over the past several months, as you can imagine. Fastenal has been able to supply them with PPE and with the disinfectants and the cleaning products that are necessary. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, that, that is between the, the I, I get the numbers. I don't get the details of, of the service and, and how that's working. Uh, I can just say I know Fastenal's business model, so I'm sure that they are very hands-on in helping the, the campuses with their PPE needs, with their sterilizing and their cleaning needs on campus. I have no doubt that they've been on many campuses uh, giving their expertise and their, their knowledge about how that works. Uh, unfortunately, I am removed from that, from the process between Fastenal and the, and the campuses, so I can't directly speak to how well that's going. I, I can just say because of the, I mean, almost tenfold increase in spend, I, I have to assume that things are going very well. Thank you. And if you'd like, I can reach out to Fastenal and get, get a more in-depth answer for that. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Yes. So last but not least, we have a program for intercollegiate sports insurance. Looks like it's, why is it not moving? Let's see. Well, I'll try this. There we go. Uh, we've had a program for uh, about three years with Pan American Life Insurance Group. You would think that would be life insurance, but it's not. Uh, it's intercollegiate sports insurance. Uh, we started looking for an intercollegiate sports insurance package. Uh, when, I, when I came on board for the coalition, I said, well, we've got student health insurance. Where's the, where's the complementary athletic insurance? Because one should complement the other and, and the coverages should not overlap. You know, where, where is it? And I found out we did not have any. So we started looking and found in Pan American Life a unique program that uh, wasn't being offered very, very wide. Any, well, I couldn't find it anywhere else. It's a, uh, it's a waiver program for intercollegiate sports insurance. And you might ask, how in the world can you have a waiver program for intercollegiate sports insurance? 
Well, the waiver program works this way. It says, I, as an institution, am going to set a limit. Say it's a $2,000 deductible, $1,000 deductible, 500, whatever limit you want. You set the limit and say, all my athletes must carry insurance, personal insurance, equal to a deduct up to zero to $500 deductible or zero to $1,000 deductible. Well, by doing that, if you think about it, think of where the majority of the claims in athletic insurance are. The majority of the claims, it's the 80-20 rule or even the 90-10 rule. The majority of the claims are in that zero to 500, zero to 1,000 uh, bandwidth. So by requiring them to have parents insurance or a, a student insurance that actually covers athletic, which is very rare, but if they have uh, a separate insurance policy, then you're not requiring your intercollegiate sports to cover that zero to a thousand dollar initial claim or, or set of claims. And you're eliminating 80 to 90% of the claims out of your intercollegiate sports insurance. So now you're just looking for a thousand to, if you're NCAA, I think it's 90,000 now where the NCAA uh, insurance program kicks in. So you're looking for that coverage, zero to 90,000, but you're looking for coverage of 10% of your claims or 20% of your claims. So we've seen as much as 25 to 30% reduction in intercollegiate sports insurance premiums just by doing that. Now you can use that savings to do it. Of course, as soon as, as soon as I heard about this, I said, so what, what do we do? Because we have athletes that are underprivileged. They, they're socioeconomically, their parents may not be able to afford insurance. The coaches are going to want them on the teams. What do we do? Well, we back this through Pan American with individual policies for those students. But if you think again, if you're, if, if you're only, if you're only paying for the students that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, then you're just paying for a small portion of those athletes of your entire population of athletes. You're not paying for every athlete for every claim zero to a thousand dollars you're still saving a lot of money by doing this. So that's the waiver program that we have with Pan American Life. Uh, very popular once people understand it, once the athletic directors understand it or are comfortable with it. Uh, and the waiver, if the waiver program makes sense for you, then, then it's great. If you're a college that has 95% of your athletes are full Pell eligible, I'd say don't look at it. Uh, but if, if you think it might be a, a, a fit for you, it, it certainly doesn't hurt to get a quote. Now, what we found in working with Pan American Life is not only do were they good at the waiver program, but they were also good at just standard intercollegiate sports insurance. So we asked them to put together a program for us just for the normal everyday intercollegiate sports insurance. And then we said, and not only do we need that, but we need a, a top broker in the field. Uh, we want a national experience broker that's been doing intercollegiate sports for a long time. And we found that in Borden and Perlman. Uh, I hope some of you may be familiar with Borden and Perlman. Uh, they and a couple of others, they're, they're, this is a small space, a small niche market, intercollegiate sports insurance is. There's about three to four brokers out there. Borden and Perlman is one of those three to four. They're probably, if they're not number one, they're number two in the nation as far as, uh, as, far as number of schools and, uh, and premium value. Uh, under their brokerage firm. So uh, I, I just I just say it, it makes a lot of sense to get a quote. This is this could be some low-hanging fruit for you. I know we're all looking at this time. We've been through COVID and, and hopefully your enrollments are up, but uh, some of your enrollments, uh, I know you're probably tuition driven as I was. I was always looking for somewhere somehow to save a little money. Uh, even if you save some money here and can drive it back into your athletic programs, it would be well worth taking a look at, uh, at the Pan American Life Insurance Intercollegiate Sports Program. Uh, any questions on that program? Hearing none. Can you, I think that's all the programs we had talked about discussing that the coalition currently has. Uh, if there's just any general discussion, usually when I stand up in front of a group of CFOs, the last slide I put up says, 
So what keeps you up at night? Because I know there was always something that kept me up that I worried about that I knew was hitting my budget and darn, I just can't get my arms around this expense. What do I do? Uh, so I'll, I'll throw that out to everyone. What What is keeping you up at night? What is bothering? What do you think if you had, if, if we could bring leverage of a thousand uh, different schools and, and all those students to bear, how can we help you? Uh, I just let me add to, we had talked about the multiple employer plan, the MEPs. And oh, the I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Probably more than we can get to on this call, but certainly I'm, that is something that I, I would like for the institutions to have more information about at some point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, let me just, let me just sidestep and give you a little information on that. And then we'll go back to what keeps you up at night. Uh, well, and we'll do that very quickly because I see we're running short on time. Uh, Multi-employer plan, many of our states have done this. The coalition has not put its foot into the water on a multi-employer plan because it's pretty state-specific. Uh, multi-employer plans are just what they say. It's a retirement plan for the, all the schools that want to participate in it. It's a wonderful concept. It really makes a lot of sense. Uh, what kept me up at night a lot was my retirement plan. It was signing off on that on that retirement plan and the compliance of that retirement plan on an annual basis. My president didn't, Stanton, my president didn't want to sign off on that at all. He made me sign off on it. So uh, I had to sign off on it. And the thing that, the, that a lot of people don't realize is when you sign off on that, you're not signing off only as the CFO of the organization. You are signing personally when you're signing off and taking fiduciary liability. So that's a scary thing to me. Think of how many dollars and how, how people feel about their retirement and how quick, if there was some mistake made, uh, a class action suit could jump. That's what scares me about the retirements that are at each of our institutions. A multi-employer multi retirement plan puts that liability into a separate entity from the college and you don't sign off on it anymore, there, that liability gets transferred to this entity. Uh, this entity then does all the record keeping, all the investment advising. It, uh, you only have one 990 and one audit from now on. So you're not responsible for the 990 and audit anymore. It gets transferred to this uh, multi-employer program. Uh, there are, you, you don't necessarily have to do it within your state. Uh, you can, there, there is, I know at least one multi-employer plan for higher education. It's through the NAIA schools. So if you're an NAIA school, you have access to that multi-employer plan. Uh, there are other national plans that you might look at, but, um, but these, are, these are predominantly done through, uh, through each state. Uh, to do it in your state, you'd hire an attorney that would drive this and, uh, and uh, you'd form a committee, uh, we, can, uh, we can get you in touch with, uh, I think Virginia was, uh, was one of the first, Wisconsin was one of the first plans. A lot of other states have followed suit. Uh, this is something that, that I would very much encourage you all to take a look at, if for no other reason than the liability standpoint. Uh, are there any questions on MEPS? That was real. That was a really quick overview of a very complicated subject. We also have in the chat line um, information: op HR, operational services, payroll, handbook, employee relations, etc. IT services not through E and I. And we had talked about that on our call as well um, briefly. So if you can share right. some info. Yeah, let me pull that chat up so I can. And as uh, I know those questions from Dr. Holland, um, in terms of scale too, especially with IT licensing, for example, um, you know, what could be a major cost factor for our institutions, especially smaller institutions, but what um, we could do together as well as other services. Right. We don't have a licensing uh, program right now. I can refer you to your IT director should be, um, should be familiar with another consortium called HESS, H-E-S-S. -S. It's a consortium of IT directors. 
uh, all across the nation and it's growing like crazy. They're concentrating right now on ERP systems, but I know they've got, uh, they've got other uh, licensing opportunities. Uh, we can certainly look at all the licensing options for you all in Louisiana, uh, you know, Adobe and, and all the others that, that you have to have. We can, we can take a look at that. Uh, a lot of states have done that on their own and, and have been pretty successful. So uh, I, I'll just commit this to you, Stan. We'll talk with Kenya and we'll see what makes sense. And, uh, and we'll try to put something together either just for your state or on a national basis. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble finding my chat. This is where I'm IT uh, ignorant. I am having trouble finding the chat, so I'm having trouble, Ken, you finding the, uh, the questions. So it's, it's along the lines of when you and, Anit oh. and I spoke around packaging specific services for our member institutions within the state, and that's how we got in the conversation of MEP. We talked about IT, and you did share the information that they should be connected through HES, but certainly could work with us on that. This yep. will be specifically to op HR operational services. So if you can give some insight into that. So payroll, handbook, employee relations, et cetera. Not sure. through we, we talked with ADP and have talked with ADP over the years. Uh, ADP is not interested in, in a program with us. Uh, so they're kind of out. Uh, I talked with another company called Paycor, who is domiciled in, uh, well, they've got three different corporate headquarters. Their main headquarters is in Cincinnati, uh, which luckily is, is just a few miles up the road. So I've been to their headquarters three or four times. Uh, they've had a lot of problem internally just getting their arms around putting, they, they I'll just say this, they want to be in the education space and then they don't want to be in the higher ed space. So uh, until they, until they, devote some resources to it and really get serious, then Paycor is out. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know from the group, are you interested in, in payroll services or is it the HR services? And if it's the HR services, what in particular in HR are you looking for? Because that spans a, a, a gamut from recruitment, which is a big piece, recruitment of personnel to, uh, to just general HR day-to-day uh, -day organization and maintenance. Um, yeah, I'm interested, this is Tina Holland, uh, I'm interested in, in payroll, that's mm -hmm. one thing, but I'm also interested in um, uh, those day-to-day -day HR services. Uh, school our size, our recruitment and retention, we can, um, I think we have the resources to be able to do that as, uh, with such a specialized area that we have, but um, I'm talking about, um, you know, things like the the uh, housekeeping aspects of onboarding and offboarding and, um, you know, uh, employee relations, um, uh, essentially, um, you know, updating and maintaining employee uh, handbooks, um, overseeing um, people's understanding of benefits, mm -hmm. um, and enrolling in benefits and that sort of thing, although the benefits are, uh, would be handled obviously, um, you know, by another, are, are, are a, a different, um, I guess, area, but these people would be um, responsible for keeping the uh, folks educated on what their benefits are. And uh, so it's really um, the, your day-to-day -day, uh, HR functions. Right. So there, there are two options with that. There, there is obviously you can outsource your, your HR, which means in, in two different ways. You can outsource your HR by, with a program by having someone uh, on site. So, so just like uh, maybe your food, food service is, self, is, is not self-op, but it's outsourced. A company will put an HR director on campus uh, for you. And, uh, and as you can imagine, that can be a little pricey. It can get you what you need, but it can be a little pricey at that point. Uh, or you can outsource by, and, and this, this is what I would do if I was a smaller entity and, and could not find real quality HR, maybe Sherm 
uh, certified HR directors. I would, uh, I would outsource, you can outsource with an HR director that is not on site, but uh, on demand. Uh, these companies will have an HR director that is your HR director. You're just leveraging them among two or three other entities. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me, but you're still going to need that administrative assistant to that HR manager on the ground to, uh, to run down people, <laughs> to, to meet with them and then figure out what form they needed to sign or didn't sign or uh, that sort of thing. So right. we you know we've got that H that outsource um, where it's a, a HR director on demand and it doesn't work very well because um, there's always choices being made on who's the priority and who's not. So um, my advice to anybody that's going down that road, um, don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Okay. Um, but I, I was curious to know how, you know, what it would take to get somebody on campus that was an outsourced um, body, like a, um, like your food services or, um, you know, a bookstore kind of person that would there, be your HR person. There are companies that do that and, and we, we certainly can, can talk to them and see what we can do. It's, you're, you're almost getting into a, a recruitment company instead of a um, yeah, HR that. company when, right. when you do that. Uh, so that's, that's the problem with HR. Uh, the HR companies that we've talked to are more, we have software that, uh, that makes the whole HR function much more efficient and, and uh, it, it thinks of things that you might not, because HR is so full of compliance. Uh, but I, I oversaw HR when I was uh, financial uh, VP of finance at, at both colleges and several hospitals. And, and HR, when it really comes down to it, to me, is, is the counseling of your supervisors across campus to keep you out of trouble. Uh, you know, hiring and firing and what you should say and what you can't say. Mm -hmm. and, and making sure that you just, it, it's mi liability mitigation. Right. And you can't, a, a good HR director will save you money in the long run. So it's, it's it, they're hard to find, but boy, when you find one, you, you need to keep it. Uh, that, that's why a lot, of, a lot of what we've talked to gets into the, the recruitment more than it gets into the actual day-to-day -day running of HR. The line, will this be an area that you all will continue to research into and see what some of the effective practices are or potential partners? And it may be the type of thing that we have a further conversation around, you know, the needs of our institutions. Yeah. And, and I, I know, uh, is, is it Dr. Holland? I know Dr. Mm -hmm. Holland may have had a, uh, a, is having a bad experience and, and I don't know the situation and we could talk offline. Uh, sometimes if you can, if you can limit the sharing of that HR director to certain entities, uh, maybe it's three different entities that, that know each other, know each other well, and the presidents are comfortable with each other. Uh, Dr. Holland's smiling. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. Uh, I have seen that work well before. I'll just say that. Uh, not sure. Not sure what. what yeah. I don't have a whole lot of um, hope in that direction, but um, you know, you're a, uh, previous experience defines your, your, your choice. So, yeah. Um, and then the IT part, um, that, that keeps me up at night. Um, you know, we, we outsource it right now, but through um, a, a health system, we plug into a health system IT and it's not a great fit. So, so we're looking at um, uh, everything from infrastructure to, you know, people to, um, uh, to operations for our IT and right. need to do some comparative shopping. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that the, the direction IT needs to go with all our smaller institutions is obviously to the cloud. Uh, as much hardware as you can, switch to the cloud. As much software as you can, switch to the cloud. Uh, maintaining high-level programming and and um, ex programming expertise and other expertise at each institution 
uh, from a dollars and cents standpoint. Now, if you can afford it, that's great. If you've got a great big endowment, but if you don't, if then it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep that on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, you can really outsource that really well. And, and that's just going to be the trend. It, it, it is there. Uh, technology today and the ever increasing baud rates and, and, you know, upload and download times, it, it's just going to push that even further. Uh, we've been talking to a firm about, uh, about how, uh, how we can put a program together for, uh, for online cloud services for the colleges. Uh, this, this company has mirroring that is, I mean, they're mirrored West coast to East coast and North South. So they've got about four different data centers where your, your information would be mirrored. Uh, if you're involved with them, you'll never lose information. Uh, well, I won't say never, you know, you, the odds of you getting hacked and losing information through one of these services is so much less than if you're maintaining it on your own campus. It's, it's at some point your insurance will go up dramatically if you're not in the cloud with all your, all your services. Right. Uh, that's just, that's, that's where we're headed. Uh, I, I came from a, and I, and I say that because I came from an institution where my provost demanded that uh, all our servers be right on campus because she wanted control of, of what was there. And, and I understand that, uh, but that was several years ago and we're just moving into a, a complete new realm. Um, there were two other points in the chat line that I'll read to you. One was um, in terms of your question of keeping folks up at night is actually revenue generation, but the retirement issue is a big one. So around revenue generation is something that keeps one participant up. And then there was another question. What about shared investment services as it relates to endowment management? So. Sure. So shared investment services, I can I can take that one on. Um, yeah, shared investment services. We we're talking with uh, with a group right now. Um, won't mention their names, but uh, the problem that I've run into in talking with other CFO groups and presidents about shared investment services is everybody has their own favorite broker or investment firm, uh, and I, I'll just harken back to my CFO days. My uh, audit and finance committee of my board was they, I think every member of the audit and finance committee used a different investment firm and they all had their favorites and they all wanted the college to use their favorite. There was, there was a definite lean toward using a particular one. Uh, I'd be interested from the group, would, would, you, all, would you all have that uh, relationship requirement, that political problem or are you would you be able to move to a a new investment firm that was a, a national based investment firm one through the coalition that's a question that would have to be posed and discussed with the presidents um you yeah. know oftentimes we're not really prepared to speak to okay. that now. we do that's know that we're always interested in gathering the information um that you can supply to us in order to to start okay. that we have two presidents on if either of them care to chime in it would, it, it would definitely um, be something we'd have to take to our board, uh, you know, and uh, because they, may, they are the ones that are, are responsible for our, our investments. Um, the investment committee typically determines investment policies. So, um, and, and it is uh, uh, possible to, to be in some shared investment arrangements. I mean, we, my university is. Um, Part of our investments are, are done completely separately and part of them are done as part of a, um, uh, a foundation with one of our affiliates. And we gain um, greater um, return on our investment because we can commingle funds in, on, with that portion of our, our investments. But the downside is you have to watch very, very carefully what they're investing in because uh, their board has different values than our board might have. And our board is very particular about the kinds of businesses that we um, invest in, particularly as it relates to our mission. So 
um, there's uh, you know there's a, it, it's it has its positives, but it takes a lot of oversight in, on the part of the board and a lot of engagement uh, on the part of the uh, investment committee of the board. And, and, and forgive me if I, I tend to just be very pragmatic and ask questions and and not be if if this is a sensitive question then then don't, don't feel like you need to answer but thank you dr Holland. i appreciate mm -hmm. that um but it's it, i i found it to be a, a political question that in a in a lot of schools so we have hesitated to to really look for a program with investment uh for investment managers or investment firms mm -hmm. uh, if if we get a, if we get more uh, i mean if you all feel that it's worthwhile uh if we get enough interest in it, then we certainly can, can do that. And um, then one last question. I'm sorry, was someone speaking? I, I just saw somebody wanted to know about tuition insurance. Yes. 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 Tuition insurance. We have, uh, we've been down the road with tuition insurance. Actually, we did have a program with Liberty Mutual and found, uh, we thought there would be a lot of interest and uh, we had pretty darn good prices with Liberty Mutual. Uh, but then there, we found no takers with Liberty Mutual. So we, we no longer have that program. Uh, I, there seems to be, there, tuition insurance seems to be seasonal. It seems to be when there's, when, when there's a pandemic, everybody's worried about tuition insurance or when there's something that comes up like this. Uh, but then in other years, there, there, there seems to be very little interest in tuition insurance. So uh, tuition insurance is really hard for the brokers to make affordable if they don't make it a, if you want it to be voluntary, then it pretty much doesn't work. You have to make it a, a mandatory with all your students. So uh, found very few schools that want to make another mandatory fee in their, in their mix. Uh, I would have loved it, it as a CFO at the schools because I always had, you know, the special circumstances of, of someone's someone's grandmother died and they wanted to get out of paying, paying the tuition and you were after the drop ad date, et cetera. But uh, it just didn't work. It, it, it doesn't work unless you're willing to do the, the hard or the, the mandatory program. And you can see the chat now line. Yes, I can. You just so, came in gauge. Do you use to determine if participating schools are actually spending with these partnerships? Yeah. The, uh, the actual, the vendors supply us on a quarterly basis, some actually on a monthly basis with the spend. So we know how much spend is going through. We know which programs are popular, which know which programs are waning, if any. Uh, we know, and if we, see, if we see programs that are not producing like we thought they should, or if there seems to be a hiccup somehow, then we'll go back to the vendor, find out what's going on. Uh, we may ask the state association to inquire to see uh, where, if there's a problem, if, uh, if maybe another vendor has sharpened their pencils a little more and we'll go back to our vendors and try to improve the rates. So yeah, we, we get our information from the vendors themselves. The reason that I asked that question is because in my prior position, um, E and I was not generally speaking the most competitive, uh, consortium that was out there. So we had, I, I originally was from New York State. We had several consortiums that we used, uh, New York State Industries for the Disabled. Um, that's a huge one up there as well. So, um, and I found being here at Loyola that the same problem exists with ENI. So, for instance, we get our Dell computers directly from Dell. Uh, and we're getting better pricing than the Louisiana State contract or ENI. Wow. So that's why I was kind of wondering um, specifically as it applies to ENI, um, how that all, how you all gauge that. Well, we are, we've heard that a couple of other, no, I won't say a couple. We've, we've heard that sporadically through the nation. Um, so we are actually evaluating ENI as a GPO right now uh, to determine, just as you said, what. And that's part of my call today in, in just a couple hours with, uh, well, actually in an hour with Eric Frank, the new CEO, you know, what are you going to do? Because these contracts, 
these contracts may be great for the public institutions. Maybe when you buy on massive scale, they make sense. But my privates are telling me that they're not the best contracts available on the market. So why should we stick with you as a GPO? Why shouldn't we go find uh, a GPO that's doing better? Uh, well, I actually thought I came from a state institution in New York. So I actually thought maybe there might be a difference <laughs> going to a private, but unfortunately, we do use uh, e &I for Granger, uh, which is very competitive on that side, but any kind of the tech items, uh, software, um, they're just not uh, as competitive as I can get in other places. Good to know. Very good to know. Uh, are you using GPOs for, for the other places or are you negotiating independently? It depends, actually, on what it is. So uh, the Dell con the Dell pricing, we get directly from Dell. Um, so we do a regular compare on Louisiana state contract because that is actually the lowest one that we found uh, so far. Um, so we do a check on it just to see. Um, in terms of Granger, we do have a local relationship with the Granger uh, that's local to us. Um, but they, you know, the most competitive is the ENI pricing that we get from Granger. So there's kind of a blend there. So I guess it just really depends on the commodity or the service that we're buying, um, where our where our spend goes. Um, local vendors are doing okay. You know, they're keeping our business. Um, so I don't think I've heard any complaints too much along that way. Um, but uh, definitely through e and I, it's a, it's a hit or miss for us, definitely. You're not alone. I, I've heard that. So just uh, we are evaluating whether e and I is where we should be or not. And, you know, their website does not help their cause. That's, you know, flat out a major problem with e and I. Right. You know, if it, if it did ever operate more like Amazon, I mean, that would be a huge step in the right direction. Um, but I've been doing, you know, purchasing or procurement for 30 years, and I literally try to avoid their website. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody else? So I want to share with all the participants, I did put it in the chat, we will get the link from this recording and send that out to you so that you have that. And we'll also um, be sending the um, attachments to all of these um, parts of the presentation, the various different resources that Lion has shared. And I will ask him to include the, a couple of the other resources that weren't presented today, but that we verbally talked about around IT, um, this recent um, conversation and then <coughs> HR. So make sure that you just um, stay tuned to your email for that information. We'll also circle back to get a sense from our member institutions on today of where you would like to head next in terms of uh, the direction of furthering these conversations. 